Well, I trust you had a Merry Christmas. Everybody have a good Christmas? Celebrating the birth of Christ and enjoying time and the blessing of our families. And this is the last Sunday in 2019. We're looking forward to a great new year in 2020. We're continuing in our message series, Extravagant Grace, and my message today is called Saved by Grace. And we're going to be talking about the incredible transformation that happens in every person who is saved through God's grace. Now, we're going to talk about an example of that transformation as we look at the story of a man named John Newton. Let me tell you his story. John was born in London in 1725. John's mother was a Christian, and she began to teach him at an early age from the Bible. However, she died prematurely of tuberculosis when John was just six years old. And after that, John grew up, I would say, too fast. He began sailing on merchant ships at the age of 11. Sailing around the world, as he grew into his teens, he began working on slave ships that would travel to Africa, carry goods to Africa, and return back with slaves on board. As you might imagine, life on the high seas was not, um, was not the most righteous life, and John began to drink heavily. He got into all kinds of trouble. He was described by people who know him as having the most profane mouth of anybody they'd ever heard. Not the best record you would want to be known for. He mocked believers. Anybody who believed, he mocked. He got into all kinds of trouble. He was publicly flogged for some of the things that he did. He was actually captured himself and held as a slave in Africa for a period of time. He suffered bouts of de depression. He miraculously escaped a number of situations where his life was in danger. In 1748, John was at the ripe age of 23. Uh, having done more wrong things than many people even think about in a lifetime. But John's ship encountered a very severe storm at sea. The wind and the waves were so high that the livestock on board were washed off board into the sea and the sailors tied themselves to the mast to keep on board. The storm continued for a long time. This, the ship was badly damaged by the storm. It began to leak. And the crew, all they could do was try to pump water out to keep the ship from sinking. The storm continued. The men were running out of food. And finally, John called out to God and asked God to save them. And miraculously, the storm quieted down and the ship finally limped into port. After God answered his prayer, John began to remember the things that his mother had taught him. He began to read the Bible once again. And he, as he read the Bible, he remembered the things his mother had taught him. And he knew now he was a sinner. There was no question about it. Not only he knew, everybody else knew. Uh, he was a sinner and there was nothing that he could do to save himself. He put his faith and trust in Jesus to forgive him of his sins through his death on the cross. And John, after he was saved, began to study for the ministry. He became one of the most influential pastors in all of England. He worked with William Wilberforce to get slavery abolished. He'd been working on slave ships and he was convicted. That was completely wrong. He worked with Wilberforce to have, and he saw before he passed on, slavery abolished in England. He wrote hundreds of hymns. The most famous one was Amazing Grace, which really captured the story of God's grace in his life. You wonder when we sing about a wretch like me? Well, that was John speaking of himself. God's grace reached down to a wretch like him living in complete rebellion against God and transformed his life and now he was leading others to Christ. And so today we're going to be talking about how sinners like John Newton, like you and me, maybe not to the depths of debauchery as John was, but each of us 
was a sinner. And those of us have been saved. We've been saved by God's grace. So let's try to understand what this whole topic of salvation by grace is all about. What, what is the Bible speaking of? How can we understand it? Well, to understand grace, we have to start by understanding God's law. God's law exposes sin. What is God's law? Well, God's law is, is given to us in God's word, particularly the Old Testament. It exposes sin in our lives. Every human being, the Bible says, is a sinner. And we all tend to minimize or even deny our own sins. Oftentimes, people will even rationalize that the sin they are doing is right, that it's good. In the Garden of Eden, if you remember back to Genesis, God was the one who defined sin. And sin was eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, don't do it. Uh, if you do, you're going to die. God defined what was good and evil. When Adam and Eve ate of the tree, they chose to make their own definition of good and evil. They decided, even though God said eating of the tree was wrong, that it was harmful, they decided it would be a good thing. They defined evil as good. And so they fell into sin. They were very wrong. And the consequences of their fatal choice reverberate to our day to day. God's law exposes sin by actually defining sin. Let's look at Romans 3.19. It says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So in the Old Testament, God expands his revelation of his law. Through the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, God defines what is right and God defines what is wrong. The most familiar summary of the law is the Ten Commandments. And then those are expanded in a multitude of ways in the Old Testament. We are all held accountable to God for our sin of breaking God's law. We've all broken God's law in one way or another. And these verses in Romans show us that the law gives us the knowledge of what sin is, the knowledge of what is right, the knowledge of what is wrong. And yet, these verses tell us we can't be justified in God's eyes by keeping the law. Why not? Because no one ever has or ever could keep the law perfectly. We all break it in one way or another. Well, in multitudes of ways, we all break God's law. And that causes sin. When we break the law, it's sin, and sin brings death through the law. Paul writes in Romans 7, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me for sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. Thinking back again of Adam and Eve in the garden, they were, they were once alive spiritually in the garden. They were walking with God. They were talking with God. They had a relationship with God. Until the commandment came regarding the tree. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then sin came alive through the serpent. It tempted them. They disobeyed. They died spiritually and ultimately physically. In the same way, children today before they understand right and wrong, are alive spiritually. The age at which they understand right and wrong is often referred to as the age of accountability. And then they begin to choose. And what, do, what does every child choose? If you're a parent, you know. <laughs> they choose to do wrong things. They choose to disobey their parents. They choose to disobey God's word. The commands of what we're not supposed to do and what we're supposed to do subtly entice us into disobedience and they bring death into our lives. In Romans 7, Paul goes on, we're not going to read all the verses, but he gives an example that the law says, you shall not covet. And he says that learning about that command caused him to desire to do what? To covet. And so he broke the law after learning what the law was. The law turned, sin turned the law around, and rather than keeping him from coveting, 
it was used as a temptation to covet. It was just like what happened in the Garden of Eden. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good. Why not? I think maybe, maybe it's good. Maybe it's something we should do. Maybe God is keeping us from something good. Just a silly illustration of something. If I tell you, don't think about pink elephants. Who is keeping my command? Everyone is thinking about pink elephants. So uh, the prohibition actually achieved the opposite of effect that it intended. Now, the Old Testament law, if you've ever started to read the Old Testament in Genesis and go through, you find it's very lengthy, might I say very tedious, to read through all of the Old Testament laws. All the things that God commands us to do and the things we're commanded not to do. Besides the Ten Commandments, which is actually quite brief, we have other moral laws. We have social laws, food laws, purity laws, feasts to be observed, sacrifices and offerings to be made. Now, could anyone have any hope of keeping all those laws, even if they tried the hardest? And the answer is no. It's, it's simply impossible. And so the law exposes sin. And each and every one of us, and no one, these verses say that we've read, can be justified or made right with God by keeping the law. No one can be justified before God by doing good works. On the other hand, grace provides righteousness. Romans 3.21 says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And so the now, but now that this verse is speaking of is what Jesus has accomplished for us in the New Testament. The law spoke of the coming Messiah, but the law did not bring the righteousness of God. Righteousness comes to who? To those who believe and put their faith in Jesus Christ. Now what is righteousness? Well righteousness is having your sins forgiven. Righteousness is being cleansed of evil. Righteousness is having a right relationship with God. And this righteousness does not come by keeping the law, by doing good things. It comes through faith in Jesus Christ. It comes through the grace of God to those who don't deserve it. Like all of us. Because we've all sinned. Everyone needs grace. Verse 23 says, for all, you might want to circle that word, all, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All, everyone has sinned. There are no exceptions. To sin is to fall short of the glory of God. God created us to show his glory to everyone. And when we sin, it causes us to miss out. It, it warps, it distorts the glory of God that God wants to shine through us. And what is the solution to sin? Well, it says God offers his grace as a gift. A gift to all sinners, to every sinner. And when we receive that gift, we are justified. Justified means just as if I'd never sinned. Our sins are forgiven. God doesn't see them anymore. That's what redemption means. All these words that are used here that are not in our normal language. Jesus has redeemed us. He's paid the price through his death that we might be set free from our sins. And how is this grace received? It's received by faith. Verse 27, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By the law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And so these verses speak of two kinds of law. The first is the law of works. The majority of people believe in the law of works. And that law says, if I'm good enough, if I do enough good things, then God's going to accept me. If the good things I do outweigh the bad things I do, then I'm going to go to heaven. Everything's going to be fine between me and God. That is the law of works. But the law of works doesn't save anyone, for good works cannot forgive your sins. And everyone has sinned. We're all sinners. Obviously, some people are greater sinners than others, but it doesn't matter. 
Just uh, one little sin is enough to break your relationship with God and put you under the curse of death. If we were saved by what we did, then we could boast about it. And people do that all, uh, people who think they're saved by doing good do that all the time. Well, I'm better than that person. I don't do the things they do. But God's word says we can't boast because we're only saved by the law of faith. All we must do is believe in Jesus to forgive our sins and then we'll be justified. And so grace provides righteousness and a relationship with God which the law could never do. Now these truths are, are really very important. They're vital for us to understand because every other religion in the world teaches that you are made right with God by works, by doing certain things. Now people say, you know, there's all kinds of religions, right? There's Christianity, there's Hinduism, there's, there's uh, Islam, there's Buddhism, and we could go on and on. They say, well, they're just different flavors. No, Christianity stands apart from all the other ones. All the other religions say that you're made right with God or some deity by doing certain things. Christianity is the only one that says, no, you're made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ, who is alive. All the other founders are dead. Even many people who call themselves Christians believe that they are saved because of the good things that they do. But the Bible teaches in many places, including the verses we studied today, that no one can be saved by being good enough because all have sinned and even one sin brings death. Spiritual death, separation from God in this life and the next. And so we receive God's grace through faith, believing in Jesus Christ to forgive our sins. Now let's look at the Results of God's grace in a believer's life. Grace produces life. Romans 8 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And so when you believe in Jesus, the Bible says that you are now in Christ. Now just think about, I mean, think about that literally. Okay, here's Jesus. When you believe, you are now inside of Jesus, in a sense. And when God looks at you, what does he see then if you are in Christ? He sees Jesus. Does Jesus have any sin? No, he lived a perfect life. He sees you as righteous. He sees you in Christ. God no longer sees your sin because it's been forgiven by Jesus who never sinned. And so the law of faith here is described as the law of the spirit of life. Sin brings death, but faith brings life through the spirit of God. And this life is eternal life. It's not simply the physical life we're living now. It's speaking of eternal life, which begins for everyone when they believe in Jesus. And it lasts forever. We're never going to die. We're never going to be separated from God. It sets us free from the law of sin and death. And so how does grace produce life in the believer. Well, Christ, we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. Christ lives in us. Galatians 2 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives where? In me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And so as Christ was crucified on the cross, so we as believers who are in Christ have been crucified as well. Now, what does that mean? It means that the old us, the sinner that we once were, is now dead. And the Bible says we've been born again. We've been given new life. We are new creations. Just as Christ was raised from the dead, so we have been, as it were, raised from the dead, and Jesus Christ lives in us. His life empowers us. His life guides us. His life directs us. And we live this life in Christ the same way we were saved, by faith. And as we do that, that grace continues to work in us. It transforms us. 
Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1, verse 14, And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me, this is Paul writing, with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Now this was written by Paul, the greatest apostle who ever lived. Before he was saved, Paul, or his name was Saul, was a zealous Jew. In fact, he was so zealous, he thought he was serving God by persecuting Christians. He was directly involved in imprisoning and killing Christians for their faith. He thought he was doing God a service by stamping out this ungodly cult. But Jesus reached down. He appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus, and God's grace completely transformed Paul's life. He considered himself, because of his past, the greatest sinner who'd ever lived. But Jesus came to him, offered him grace, and through faith, Paul was born again. And rather than persecuting Christians, Paul was now actively being a witness for Jesus, and in turn, being persecuted. The very thing he did, he was now being persecuted, and history records uh, he was a martyr. He lost his life uh, as a martyr for Christ. But his life was changed. And once we are saved by grace, that grace transforms us from the inside out. And now God empowers us to keep God's law, to do the right things and not do the wrong things. Because it's written on our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And so grace produces the life of Christ in us. So that we think, we act, and we talk more and more like Jesus. Grace produces life. Let's think a little bit more about how grace produces life in us. How does Christ live inside of us? He lives inside of us through his spirit, the Holy Spirit. And since the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, he speaks to us. The Spirit speaks to us and we can speak to him. The more that we're filled with the Spirit, the more that we can work, the more he can work in and through our lives. The Spirit can transform our thoughts, our desires, our actions as we submit to him. We're going to talk more about this in a couple of Sundays, but the Spirit breaks bondage to sin and sinful habits in our lives as we cooperate with him. The Spirit causes us to desire to live for God each day. In every day. Now how can you share God's grace with others? Let me just propose two simple questions that you can ask people. You might ask somebody, do you believe you're going to heaven? Now stats show you, know, you get a 90 plus people think, 90% plus will think they're going to heaven. If they answer, uh, so most people will say they're going to heaven. But if they say, well I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't know, um, they're not saved. They're probably trying to be good enough. The reason they don't know is they don't know if they're going to meet some arbitrary mark of being good enough to make it to heaven. So they're kind of on the fence whether they're going to make it. Most people think they're going to go, so they say, oh, yeah, yeah, I think I'm going to heaven. Ask the second question, well, why do you think God is going to accept you into heaven? You know, what are your qualifications for heaven? And uh, <clears throat> most likely... Polls will tell us, they'll say, well, you know, I'm a good person. I know people a lot worse than me, you know, and they might not get in, but I got a pretty good shot. I think I'm going. If they answer anything other than faith in Jesus, they are depending on their good works to go to heaven. They haven't believed. They're not a believer. And there are people like that all around us. And then you have an opportunity to share God's grace with them. Talk to them about if they've ever done anything wrong. And most people will admit they've done a few wrong things. Not too bad, but a few wrong things. And that's going to keep them from heaven. They need God's grace with them through faith in Jesus Christ. And so that's one way to open the conversation with somebody about God's grace, good works versus faith. So let's summarize what God has taught us today. The purpose of God's law is to expose sin in people's lives. Keeping the law can't save anybody. We can't be good enough to be accepted by a holy God because each of us has sin. Everybody breaks God's law. 
And that leaves each and every person in the world in a hopeless situation except for Jesus who died on the cross to take the punishment for our sin. He alone lived a perfect life. Jesus was the only one. He kept God's law perfectly, never sinned. And that's why he's able to pay the penalty for our sin by dying for us. God raised Jesus from the dead. He accepted his sacrifice so that we could be forgiven. And when we put our faith and trust in Jesus to forgive our sin, he forgives us through his grace. And God's grace then produces righteousness in us, restores our relationship with God, produces eternal life within us. And Christ then lives inside of us by his spirit and transforms us to becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. So this morning, if you may have been trusting in your good works to have a right relationship with God, you might be trusting in that you're a good person, that surely you'll get to heaven one day because you're better than most people. And that may be true, but in God's eyes, everyone has sinned. And to receive the gift of God's grace this Christmas season, you need to first of all admit that you've sinned. Be honest with yourself. Think back. You don't have to think back very far, right? To think of something you've done that was wrong. It might be last week, last month, last year. We've all done wrong things. Just simply admit it to God. I've sinned. Secondly, believe that Jesus died to forgive your sins. Ask him to forgive you. And then commit your life to following him as your Lord and Savior. So I'm going to pray a simple prayer. If you've never prayed a prayer before like this, I'd encourage you to pray along with me. So let's bow our heads right now. And uh, even if you've perhaps made a commitment in the past, but you've drifted away and you want to renew that commitment, this would be a good time to do at the end of this year, looking forward to the new year. I'd encourage you not to put it off. If you're not sure that you're a believer today, if you're not sure that you put your faith in Jesus Christ, that you're going to heaven, that Christ lives inside of you, pray with me. Say something like this. Father, today, I admit that I've sinned. I have done wrong things. Things I knew were wrong. Things the Bible says are wrong. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died on the cross that my sins might be forgiven. And he rose from the dead three days later. I invite you, Jesus, to come into my life, to live inside of me. And I commit myself to following you as my Lord and Savior, to doing the things that you tell me to do. I put my faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today we're going to take communion as we do uh, once a month, so I'd like to ask the ushers to prepare for that. Uh, communion is for believers only, but if you just committed your life to Jesus Christ this morning, you can partake. As the ushers begin to distribute the elements, I ask that you do not partake until everyone has been served. Whatever you need in life, Jesus has made provision for it through his death and resurrection in Communion, remember what Jesus did for us by shedding his blood. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So the cup that we drink is a symbol of the blood of Christ, which brings forgiveness for our sins. We also remember what Jesus did for us through eating the bread, which represents Jesus' body being broken for us. It says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so at this time, we look back. We remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. Jesus' broken body makes available to us healing. That our brokenness might be healed, whether it's mental, physical, or spiritual. And so in this quiet time, just examine your life to see if there's any sin that you need to 
repent of, that you need to turn away from. Ask Jesus to forgive you. If there's anything in your life that you need healing of, anything that's broken, might be a sickness, might be a problem or a conflict, ask Jesus to bring healing into that area of your life. Let's eat the bread which represents the broken body of Jesus. Let's drink the cup which represents the shed blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, for the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. That brings forgiveness for our sins. That brings us hope. That saves us. We thank you for the broken body of Jesus that, that brings healing and wholeness into our lives. We ask for your healing touch to be upon those who need it this morning. We're so grateful for your grace that you freely offer to every person in this world. The grace that gives eternal life to those who accept it. Forgive us, God, for the times we don't rely on your grace and we, we try to live our lives on our own. We pray that we would always rely on your grace. We ask for opportunities to share your grace with, with so many around us or depending on the good things they do, those who are not yet saved. We thank you that you're going to use us to reach many more people with God's grace in the new year. God, we pray that you provide for each person who's making or has made a missions faith promise for 2020. We pray that you use those resources to, to cause your kingdom to expand around the world, that you cause our church here in St. Louis to impact the nations, God. We thank you for that opportunity. We thank you that one day we will know the great things that you've done by our faithfulness in giving to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.